Let's just stand this morning to the Lord in prayer for any requests as we would go to the Lord this morning. Okay, yes. Your neighbor's mother, yes. And, you, and your oldest daughter, okay. So there's lots of needs, but I'm glad he's a big God. He hears every prayer. Let's just look to him this morning. Heavenly Fathers, we come before thee. I thank you, Lord. You know the secrets of every heart, Lord. You know every prayer that has gone up before thee, Lord, this morning. And Lord, as a body, Lord, we ask that you would, Lord, look upon and meet these needs, Lord, that, is, that are needful in this hour. And Lord, as we've come here, Lord, to praise and to worship thee, Lord, we're ever so thankful that, Lord, that you have called us, Lord, that you've led us through, and Lord, we are, Lord, what no words can express, Lord, the great salvation that you have provided. And now I commit this service in your hands in that wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated this morning. everybody out. Just got a little chorus. God, God, God is your oasis. I'm going to keep God is your oasis. Great. 
the snow for the 
Anybody have a number in their hearts this morning? Which one? 67. Which one did you have? Good help. 
I wonder if we could try uh, 182 in the red book. One eight two. And time shall be no more. When the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the safe cup gather over on the other shore. And the roll is called up yonder. Linda, do you have a song this morning? No songs? Okay. Elijah, do you have a song? It's Elijah's birthday, by the way. He's 21. <laughs> he wishes. If you could see what I once was If you could go with me Oh, back to where I started from Then I know you would see A miracle of love Just a sinner saved by grace. Oh, I'm just a sinner. Oh, saved by grace. Oh, when I stood condemned to death, oh, he told my prayer. 
Sister Monique, do you have a song this morning? And Jason afterwards. like to thank the Lord this morning. Uh, this week I was reading there in Ezekiel 6 and there's a, a part where the Lord says he has broken how uh, the Israel uh, departed and went after idols and things and uh, I believe it's much the same today how that we uh, may be, well I speak for myself, keep busy with doing things uh, that don't include the Lord, but I know we have to work and we have to do things concerning our natural life, but uh, the Lord wants to be a part of our life, I believe, and uh, even the little things, and the thought just came to me how that he included me, he included me in the whole, wherever spot that I may have. I want to include him in my daily life, and I know I keep saying that, but I guess I struggle with the time and that. But anyways, uh, yesterday I was looking for something, and uh, I had to go shopping, and it's not my favorite thing to do, but anyways, uh, I was looking for something and going around and around, and when I stopped and asked the Lord to, Help me find. I found four. At the same time, I just asked the Lord, help me to find. I just thank him for everything he does.
just want to thank the Lord this morning. Uh, for anybody who has me on Facebook, you might have seen yesterday, I could barely get out of bed. My back hurt so much. It was that kind of back pain where you just hold your breath to try to stand up and leaning on the bed. And I know a few people prayed for me, and as the day went on, it, it got a lot better. And this morning, I feel not too bad. I still feel a little, little bit there, but uh, I'm able to get around at least and breathe, so <laughs> it's always good. Um, my wife yesterday uh, bought me a, a Father's Day card from my daughter, and uh, it was pretty funny because she, my wife knows I'm pretty scientific, and she bought a card that talked about cause and effect, and I just found it so funny. You know, my little girl has no idea about that, but it got me thinking about how when, when I learn about how God created the universe, I'm learning a bit about him and the complexity and everything. I, I read somewhere is that some scientists somewhere said that the odds of the universe being like it is, is a number that's about 100 numbers long and the odds are something like whatever that number is to one. And I was like, man, that's pretty awesome. You know, and like here we know, we know the God of the universe, but we can simplify it so much easier. He just wants a relationship with us. You know, he created everything for us so that we could be, so that we could, we could grow. And I, this week was so funny talking about growing. My, my daughter discovered the word no, and she said it about 100,000 times this week. <laughs> but, you know, I just laughed a little bit. Like, it's the same way. Like, God must see such joy when he sees us grow. And just to have that relationship, I mean, sure, he, he, he wants worship from us, but at the same time, he just wants that relationship with his family. And, you know, you've heard my amazing stories. I just, I'm just so, I just love my little girl so much. It helps me realize how much, you know, that's what God wants with us. And it might be a little bit different, but it's very similar in so many ways. So uh, I'm just so grateful this week. I'm going to try to sing this song. <coughs> I'm still at the tail end of a, of a cold, so my throat's not the best, but I'm going to try. Deeper within 
through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, for it's all about you. It's all about you. King of endless word, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required Search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made. And it's all about you. It's all about you. Do you have a song this morning? Yeah. I'm a pilgrim on a journey headed for better land The way gets rough and trials so hard to understand I call the one who started with me He said he'd be there till the end And when I need his strength He blesses me again And it's so hard to comprehend He takes thought of me The stars, they shine The sun rises all at His command I'm just a small, small grain of sand And I want He blesses me, He blesses me again. I've not always been the best man for the Lord that I could be. I stumble, yes, sometimes I've given in. But the Lord, He's great in mercy. In the moment I repent, I find He blesses me, He blesses me again. And it's so hard to comprehend. He 
takes thought of me. The stars they shine, the sun rises all at his command. I'm just a small, small grain of sand in the wonders of his hands and now he blesses me. Blesses me again, and it's so hard to comprehend. He takes thought of me. The stars they shine, the sun rises all at his command. I'm just a small. Blesses me, he blesses me again. Amen. Everybody's happy? Okay, at this time we'll turn the service over to uh, Brother Fred. Let you stand again. Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this part of the service, Lord. Lord, help this vessel of clay, Lord, to bring out the picture, Lord, that you laid my bosom. And Lord, I am so thankful, Lord, that you're still on that throne of mercy. Thy spirit is still leading the church on. I thank you, Heavenly Father. Now I'll commit this in your hands, in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Be seated. Everybody happy this morning? Amen. I want to look in this morning concerning how the millennium is going to be set up. When does it start? We know it's going to be a thousand years long. But before we get into it, there are things we need to realize that a parable sometimes has words in it that really you can read it in the English language and you say, well, that's what it says. Give us of your oil. Well, we don't carry kerosene lamps anymore. But it's implying a thought. I just used that one. There's many other scriptures that we can look at this morning. How the word of God, someone that don't have a revelation, well, that's what it says. Well, they can read somewhere. It says, well, we're going to walk on the streets of gold. Really? That's a carnal 
interpretation. And if we don't look to see what God is opening up in this hour, well, you should leave that alone. It's none of your business. But I'd say it's none of your business either if what God's doing in this hour. Because there are things that God is, is bringing to the forefront. And for what I see up to this point, we could be down near the end where we may see the last few nuggets before the miracle war is upon our doorstep and God bringing this bride to perfection. He's not going to perfect it by a group of men saying we're all preaching the same thing. It's going to be done by leadership. Whether they like it or they don't, look at past history from the Old Testament even to now. And so in order to appreciate this morning, before we get into scriptures dealing with the millennium, we have to look at what precedes it. Because if you don't know what the conditions are on ground, then you, you and I or different people can have different thoughts of what's, how things are to transpire. And then when they get to a place where they don't know, they say, well, God can do anything. I know that. But he uses reality to do things. The children of Israel coming out of Egypt, he could have just snapped his finger and they'd be in the promised land. Bingo. They wouldn't have to go through the natural things to go through. Very few places where God intervenes in a supernatural way to move one item into another place. We go through things, and to going through things, you have to see what's on ground at that hour and at that time. So this morning I want to start with, before we get into the day of the Lord, the, uh, setting up the millennium. Now remember, the millennium is a thousand years long. Because the Bible expresses it in a number of places. But then it comes to well, the dividing the sheep and the goats. And there's as multiple ideas on that in the religious world as you can shake a stick at. And even in this message, we have hangovers of what was there brought here because God did not really touch it to that degree or to that point in the hour that we live in. I'll get to the message soon, love. But laying a, a groundwork this morning of concerning, because we're going to be in that millennium and how and when are we going to be ruling and reigning as well with the Lord Jesus Christ? I touched on this a little bit on Thursday night, and the sister here from Kitchener was, was down here. What amazes me, here's a sister by herself in Kitchener, Ontario, sees more light than some of the ministry today. I'm amazed, just like the brother from Newfoundland. So God is not relying, we can look at a revelation and if it's been settled and proven, oh yeah, we, we believe that. But can you see what's on ground now? Do you have this, the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy, prophetic pictures? Looking at the past will not do you any good for what you're living in now. God's going to hold you and I and this bride that living now what's on ground in this hour in this third watch. You'd like to see everybody to see it, but I'm not going to compromise for the sake of having fellowship with some others that don't want to walk in the light that God has in this hour. I'm sorry, I will not, I'm not going to compromise with the Lord for your sake, for sake of fellowship. Because that never works. It's like the man that goes to a, to a tavern thinking he's going to 
maybe bring along a sinner, a sinner or a drunk along and might lead him to the Lord. You're in the wrong place. Yes, God can do it. But more often than none, you, that person that goes there gets caught up with that person and his state is worse than, than when he first went in. So saying all those things. Now as we've spoken about the day of the Lord, and I know if we touched it a while back, there's a whole lot of scriptures concerning that, but I don't want to go into every detail of it, but just enough to know. The first thing we need to know, what is the day of the Lord? When does that start? Well, it's after the week of Daniel has transpired. When Armageddon is fought, and the Pope, the Antichrist system, will, if you want to, win the day, and God sees the time is up, it's not going to be seven years and a few days, or minus or plus, Seven years is seven years of God's time, exact. And so therefore, what God first does, he shuts off the lights. He could scream from heaven, and I don't think they would want to listen anyway. But by making the earth darkened that they can't see, it gets everybody's attention. Because in carnal man, in the morning, the sun's got to rise, there's daylight in the daytime. And if something stops it and it's still dark, by the time you hit noon hour, you know something's wrong. They God's way of getting their attention, so he shuts off the lights for a while. And God shuts it off long enough, not just for a few hours, but I want to refer back to the days of Moses. And that's in Exodus chapter 10, verse 22, where Moses was told to stretch out your hand, and there was darkness for three days. They couldn't see a thing. Yet there was light in the house of Israel. Well, they might have had candles. But as far as the atmosphere, it was dark. Everything came to a grinding halt. They didn't have flashlight, batteries, and, and, and telephone poles like we have here today. Yes, they might have had them torches, but everything came to a halt because God got their attention. So can God shut off the lights? Yes, he can. If he did it in the days of Moses, he could definitely do it in this hour. And then once he's got their attention, the next thing on order, the heavens, the spirit world is opened. And they see that host that's in heaven. And now that army that's on the earth, they want to make war with the Lord Jesus Christ. To them, they think it's an alien. You think the Pope would be wiser, supposedly knowing everything about God? He don't. But it's a futile battle. God allows that sign to be there. How long is he going to allow it for? He's allowing it so they can get together to make war with him. And when they are ready for war, he's ready for war as well. And when he gets to the place that he wants to destroy that army that are, it's on the face of the earth, he brings his army. There's the angelic beings that are coming. And the bride is coming with, with him at that hour. But how is he going to destroy them? Go out with a physical sword and whoosh, cut here one like they would do in the Old Testament? No, the sword represents the power of the revelated word of God. And all he has to do is to shake the earth. And 
And when he does, it's going to reel to and fro. It's going to reel so bad that if you have sunshine here in, 12, in less than eight hours, it's dark again. The sun will go down. It'll be dark at the noonday. So what does this all have to do? All he had to do is speak concerning however that that world is going to reel to and fro. The things that describe in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, concerning the destruction of the sinners, is all a cause and effect of that initial of the earth reeling to and fro. Now, while our sister was down, Sister Kelly, just being in her place of business, some Jews came in and wanted to talk about things. She didn't have to initiate it. Well, she says, well, if you want to know more, she gave them our sites. So there could be some Jews hooked on. I'd have to say if they are. Jehovah, the great eternal spirit, is the one, and your Messiah that you've been looking for is going to be coming. He's the one that's going to be coming on a white horse. No, you don't have the New Testament to read with. God has given us the Gentile because he has cut off the Jews for a while. But I'm getting away from the message now. As this earth is reeling to and fro, what happens? The earth goes into a, vile, a violent shaking so much that the plates, uh, maybe I've got it in the other directory here. How many of you know what the ring of fire is? Well, I saw it this morning. <laughs> I know it's in there somewhere. All right, well, I'll just use words. The ring of fire is mainly around the Pacific Ocean. It goes through the western side of the United States. And now time, as the day of the Lord started, he shuts off the light, heaven is seen, the, the spirit world, then there's a destruction. And this is all taking place within a 30-day period. But when he starts to destroy the sinner, there's 7.5 billion people on the planet. And when he's starting the destructions, we read the words, islands are going to disappear, mountains are going to be moved, hail about the size of 100 pounds falling down, man is scattering all over the place trying to hide somewhere from the wrath of God. And in our minds, we think about earthquakes in our, what we've seen in the news. The earthquake that happened in the ocean, in the Indian Ocean, in 2004. It was an earthquake, but as the earth moved, it sent a whole pile of water towards the coast. This tsunami killed 280,000 people. That's a far cry from 7.5 billion. And the largest disaster that man has ever had was in 1931. In China, they had a great flood now, one of the rivers and the uh, mountains collapsed and everything went through, and that killed one million people. Now, how long would it take to kill 7.5 billion people with the disaster of the size and the scope that we see? It would take a long time, wouldn't it? So as it's, the earth is reeling to and fro, it talks about you and I going to 
see the judgment and involved in the judgment. He's involved in the judgment that we see what's taking place because only with thy eye will you see it that the bride has come down with him in that event. Now, just to get an appreciation, sometimes a picture sometimes will make things a little more dramatic if you want to. This is the tsunami in our day. One of them took place, and that would destroy a few buildings. It might go in 100 miles or so. It might kill 200,000 out of the population that may be at once. 350 million people in the country or whatever it is, large numbers. So you're not looking at destroying a minority, aren't you? Volcanoes. That's Mount St. Helen, which is just a peanut of what's going to take place when the earth reels to and fro. Because we're going to walk on the ashes of the wicked. When? That's all happening in the day of the Lord. Here's another, just to give you an idea, a scope of the destruction that will take place. Now, we read this scripture, and it's in Revelation chapter 16, that the cities of the nations, plural, around the world fell. Not just one place, all the major cities, they fall by how? By the earthquake. Now, we've had earthquakes. When I think of California, hardly doesn't do much destruction. One of the major earthquakes that took place, there's two of them that I can remember in recent memory, is down in South America in Chile. But yet it didn't destroy the whole population that was there, just a small number compared to the nation. How many remember Haiti when that took place? That too only touched a small portion of the nation. So as far as, now when we look at those, those events there, it's very small comparing, trying to slay a lot of people. Oh, there it is. There's the, the ring of fire. I was looking for it. Didn't disappear. It must have been there all the time. So all that God has done is is moved it. It's going to be of such an order of magnitude that even our biggest events of earthquakes, tsunamis, will pale compared to what God's going to launch once he moves the planet and those plates start to move. Now remember, we're talking about 7.5 billion People. And in this destruction that's taken place, it talks about after that 30 days, because the sinners will be done away with, it says very few men left. I'll probably got a scripture for that. There's some words here. There are a few scriptures that talks about that when that destruction happens, there's a few men left. It says a few men, but we have to be realistic what few means. Because we can all have different ideas of what few might be. If it's 10% of the world population is destroyed, you still have 750 million people. 10% could be called few. I'm not here to tell what few is. Now, if it's 1%, 1% out of 100, I would qualify that as being a few. A little bit maybe less and short, uh, smaller than few. 1% of the 7.5 billion people is 70 million people. 
say, well, where are you going with this? Well, we're laying a groundwork. Now, the earth being in, in a destructive state, as we see, just to get an appreciation, When the cities will fall, you won't be able to call 911. No policeman will come to your help. No fire team will come to put out the fire in your house, in your place, in case it's on fire, whatever the case may be. There will be no infrastructure to help because the devastation will have been so great. You may find a car somewhere that might still work that didn't get destroyed. But you can't drive it hardly nowhere. The streets are separated. The, the, the infrastructure, the uh, bridge and whatnot is all gone. So you can't really go hardly anywhere. And this is not just here in North America. They may find... Some bulldozer that's left over might be able to clear certain parts of the highway. But what do you do when there's a rift and a big hole? Or the bridge is gone. The bulldozer won't help you. So the population will be left in the areas where the destruction has taken place. Those that would survive the day of the Lord. Now another thing to keep in mind. Yes, by the time the 30th day, the majority or the, what God has wanted to destroy the sinners, they have been done with. Do you think that God's a cruel God destroying that much flesh? That much flesh don't believe God. It's only an intellectual. They use God as an excuse or, or whatever case may be, but they don't have the spirit of God in them to know the time frame. Had they known, they would have made themselves ready to go into a rapture. Now, when that 30 days is finished, if this earth was reeling back to and fro to the place that's going something like this, like a drunk man, there's other scriptures that, de that describes that. It can no longer, it can no more stop, she used the expression, on a dime, more than you can stop your car on a dime going down the road. So there's going to be shocks and aftershocks down through that 45 days. Right? Am I talking out of my head this morning? I don't think so. Because when we see earthquakes today, there's always aftershocks that takes place. And sometimes the aftershock can be almost as big as the actual shock itself. So it's going to take a while for the plates to simmer down. There ain't going to be no movement in those 45 days of the people in the earth. Now remember, the city's, the infrastructure is destroyed. Why is he destroying the cities in those places in the land? Because he wants to make it anew and get rid of this old man's culture that's here. He's not going to get rid of technology that might be there. Because there may be some sheep and some goats. Or those that will give their lives when they do come up in the, the millennium. They'll still have a knowledge of not starting from scratch like rubbing two sticks to make fire. Okay. Now, the reason I've done all that, because we're going to be looking at something this morning. When it comes near to the end of that 45 days, when Jesus comes and he set his foot on the Mount of Olives, there's an earthquake. 
And you can say, well, you have living here? Well, that's fine. That's up to you. The mountain will split in two because it's to fulfill a prophecy in the Old Testament that water's going to flow out there. It's going to be needed for Israel. But to me, that would be the last earthquake. It's signifying the earth has now been settled. The earth has found its, its orbit. It's not in a 360-day year yet, but the plant, what caused it to wobble has now gradually moving it towards its 360-day year rather than 365. If that was moved immediately, if you think the plates and that destruction would be wild, that would be even worse. So that's why it would take a, a millennium, a thousand years, for the earth to gradually find its orbit, because otherwise the millennium would not be a good place to live in if God was just going to move it quick. And you have your 360-day year right off the bat. Because when, when you read the book of Revelation, at the end of the millennium, that's when there's no longer great big oceans. That water will have now come above the dome of the earth. It does two things. Gives more land for the millennium, plus that dome of that water being higher stops the ultraviolet rays that are danger, danger for crop and mankind having cancers at the same time. It has a twofold purpose. God is the greatest geologist, physicist that I know. So that will be all be taking place. Now when he steps his foot on the Mount of Olives, Around that time, that's where in Ezekiel 43, verse 26 to 27, now the Jews that are left alive during the day of the Lord, mortal Jews, will now start dedicating the temple. And through all that destruction, and the sister asked me a question this morning, when's the temple and how long is it going to last? This Last temple is going to be built after that miracle war. It's going to be the temple that will live throughout the whole millennium. It won't be destroyed in the miracle war. Well, the miracle war, they're building it after. It won't be destroyed in Ezekiel 38 and 39. It's not going to be destroyed when the Antichrist goes killing the Jews in the middle of the week because he slays two-thirds, about six million. Where'd you get that? Read Zechariah chapter 13, verse 6 or 8. It'll show you. And during Armageddon, the temple, although the, the battlefront is, is in Israel, where the, the kings of the east and the beast system comes against each other, right there, the temple still stands. And then through the day of the Lord and all that shaking, the temple still stands. If God can create the universe... He knows how to settle things to have that temple still standing. Well, praise the Lord. So now we have the temple being made ready. Now comes to the part that you want to hear this morning. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. Verse 31. We're going to read two verses, or three verses or so. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then at that time shall he sit upon his throne of glory, I'm here to tell you when he sits, it puts its seat on that throne. The millennium starts. We're going to see scriptures that are going to prove this out. Then he goes on to say, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from one from another, as the sheep divides, as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. 
and he shall set the sheep on the right hand and the goat on the left hand. We read that from an intellectual, carnal point of view. The denomination has looked at, well, in order to separate the sheep, because it says, enter into the kingdom, they say that has to happen before the millennium starts. Really? That's just a carnal interpretation. We look at that verse and we literalize the words just like they are. Oh, he's going to sit on his throne. He's going to bring everybody before his throne. And he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. We don't know how they're going to get there, but God can do the miraculous thing and all that kind of stuff. That's just hopeful thinking. It doesn't lie in reading it in that manner. Those that read it in that manner, it's no fault of anybody at this point in time. But I want to say this. That's just as good as you're going to walk on the streets of gold. Revelation chapter 321, we're all going to sit on Jesus' throne, 10 million bride. Is that what the scripture is trying to portray? We lose sight that this is a parable. A parable has a spiritual or a meaning to it that yes, you're going to read those words, but the words are there enough that we can see at least an overall picture of what's there. It's just like the foolish virgin telling to the bride, give us of your oil. Are we carrying oil in some lamp that we can share with them? Are we so carnal to take that part of the scripture and then car- and make it literal? No. And of those that have, been, have not been following the revelation, when we come before the judgment seat of Christ, and this is going to torture them, those that refuse to see it. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 4. It says he's going to judge the quick and the dead. And because they haven't been following the revelation, they don't know how to put that. Where, when, and how. But you and I know this. The dead is judged by the literal Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. You and I are going to be judged by that angelic being that's projecting Christ down here. The living is the quick. That destroys their understanding of, while well, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and that's all they want to know. I'd have to say, you better tune up your revelation in this hour. Because these things are heading towards that half hour silence. And we had been better watch, not because I'm hearing someone and somebody told me that he's okay to hear. If you don't have the Holy Ghost that can show you what the picture is, asking somebody else is not going to do it. Not in this hour. Well, so and so, well, I think, well, we don't see that, and so therefore it can't be. So they trust on one another. I'd have to say, where is the testimony of Jesus Christ and the spirit of prophecy in you? Because I have to say, the majority has just stayed in 2004 and back. The Branham camp is even further back. Oh, but you don't preach love. I'm not here to... What kind of love do you think God wants to preach? Colonel love? Didn't he say, if you love me, love my word, love my commandment, love my saying? And he that's speaking from heaven, according to rejecting what's happening at this hour, you don't believe he's speaking from heaven. Only what the little, those group around there, well, we all believe this and we, we can all accept this. That's man getting together, looking on a truth. 
supposedly a truth. But where's the comfort that said that he's going to show, he will show you things to come? He did not stop in 2004. I better not get on that line. I'm not here to please people. My first love is to please him. Someone has to preach the word as it should be preached. Living in the hour that you should be living in. So now, are we all going to fit on the throne where Jesus sits? Come on now. No. Then what is the revelation to this? It's very simple. Once you hear it, it falls right into place. When you read Matthew chapter 25 verse 31, the 32, It's a parable. You have to look at it in the term of a government. Did not Jesus, either in the book of Daniel, is portrayed to him, he's going to have a dominion and a kingdom. There's no words about separating the sheep, that he has to physically do that. You find also in, other, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, he is to be given a, do, a dominion, power, and so forth. A kingdom. He's received a kingdom. Now, in receiving a kingdom, is Jesus himself going to do every individual sheep If you're looking at it from a carnal standpoint of view, that will be your view. But if you view it as his government has now come, when he sits on that throne, what is it? His government starts. Does any government in the world that has a prime minister, a president, a king, when the people do something wrong that comes before the court of law, does he has to be personally there? They do it in his name. That because he is the chief of the country. So Jesus is setting up a government. Now I got some pictures I want to show you this morning. There's the temple. Jesus sits in his seat. The seat is in the temple. In the holies of holies where it's at. How much of a crowd can you get into that inner court? Huh? They're not going to be packed like sardines. And if there is 70 million moral that's left after the destruction, how are you going to fit them there? And how long would it take individually that he can come before them and separate them? But if you look Matthew 25, just like we look at the other verses concerning the oil and all those other things, it's portraying something. Matthew 25, 31 and 32 portrays a government. Pure and simple. Because in Matthew 20, 19, he told his disciples, you'll be sitting to judge the 12 tribes. He's the king, and they are the ones that's going to sit on the throne that the sheep's going to come before, but he, they are representing the king. That's how they're coming before him. And that's just the nation of Israel. 
a very small place on the map of the world. Now, as Jesus is the one that he's given the kingdom and he says, you'll sit on my throne with me. What, are we going to literalize that? You're going to sit in the authority representing his government in the places where you and I are going to be at. You can start to see the picture this morning. That takes away, well, he's coming, sitting on the throne, he's going to separate all the sheets, he's going to do that somehow, he's going to, God's going to miraculously bring some here and whatnot, and my foot. That's not even realistic or plausible. Well, God can do anything. I know he can, but not according to your ideas. Somewhere we've got to make this real. Now, the reason I talked about the day of the Lord, there's no airplane ticket they can get. No car can reach Jerusalem. No boat will be around, probably. Not too many left. There might be some on a lake somewhere. I don't know. And so, of the different nations of the world, where we're going to sit... We'll be like the judge before that represent our prime minister or our president because you're representing him. And now he can speak the words directly because why? In him is the great eternal spirit that's everywhere present, nowhere absent. And in each member of the bride that may be sitting wherever they may sit on the earth, that spirit of the Holy Ghost is in you. You have the full measure. Information can be transmitted immediately in the spirit world. So if he has an issue in your particular country, it is the bride that's going to be there judging it. Now when the scripture, the scripture says, in, uh, I believe it's in uh, 1 Corinthians, somewhere, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, do ye not know that the saints is going to judge the world? We hear it, but we think that's after somewhere as we get settled. It's right from day one. Now I'm going to bring this home. Let's turn. To Revelation, chapter 20. Well, you're destroying my thought, my, uh, my understanding of, of Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Are we going to stay looking at a picture from a carnal point of view? There's just no way that's feasible. Because all other scripture will be tearing that to pieces that you can't fit nothing. But when it is a government, hey, no, this is believable. This is plausible. This can actually transpire in that millennium. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, he says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matter? But now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 20. The first verse. This is from verse 1 to verse 5 or 6, it's all transpiring at the same time that Jesus has sit on his throne. In verse 1 of chapter 20, he says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Why does, when does he have that? 
When is he going to bind? Because we're going to read, he laid hold on the dragon and the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Not 999 or 1010. 1,000 year. So if it is Satan is bound for a thousand years and Jesus' reign is a thousand years, this happens coincidentally at the same time. Right? You don't need to have a spiritual revelation on that one. It's, it's clear. So you're now time-wise, you're at that opening of the millennium because that Satan is bound for a thousand years. The millennium is there because Jesus has now sit on that throne. But then it goes on to say, if we drop down to verse 4, And I saw thrones. When? Right when that angel has bound Satan for a thousand years. Because aren't we going to rule and reign a thousand years also? Uh-huh. Yes, of course. And I saw a throne, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. That's your foolish virgins in, that came through the, the tribulation that went through the week of Daniel. And the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, time-wise, that tells you that took place in the week of Daniel, before the day of the Lord, that neither received the mark on his forehead nor in his hand. And they live and reign with Christ a thousand years. They too, from day one. They're going to, it's not going to take years and years to separate the sheep and the goats and however that's going to unfold and we can have all kinds of different ideas. We've, when you start looking at it from a government, he sits on his temple. The 12 apostles sit there in their chair, and they're the one that's actually dividing the sheep and the goat, and you and I are doing it in our countries. Well, Brother Fred, there's something missing. How do we all get there? Well, maybe I'll stop at this, not stop here at this time, but I just want to bring something else into mind here. Here, oh, okay. When you and I come with the Lord Jesus Christ, that's in the day of the Lord we're coming. Right? How many have read that scripture? Every eye shall see him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Every eye is going to see him. Well, he's not 10 miles wide or 100 miles long. As he's making his descent, it's held there for a space of time while the earth turns and every eye will get a chance to see him. So he's going to stay there that length of time. Number one to understand, gravity does not affect him. The earth is turning. He's not, he's not floating around with the, with the, as the earth turns. So as the earth turns, every eye gets to see him. So the, when we're in that realm of the spirit world you don't you're not affected by gravity yet on the other hand Jesus walked on the road to Emmaus and he was in his resurrected body when he's on the earth so if when he comes sitting on his throne he's not going to spin away from the throne okay we got that cleared up now what does that all entail when he does come and he's coming towards the earth, and every eye gets to see him. And it's time for him now to make his descent and touch his foot on the Mount of Olives. He's heading for Jerusalem. When the temple is finished and cleansed, he's going to sit in that temple. The moment he sits in that temple, the millennium starts. And you and I are not going to all land in Jerusalem. <coughs> We won't need a plane ticket. We won't need a boat ride. Because as he's coming to sit in that temple, you and I are going to be going wherever we are at, because we're in the air, not affected by gravity, and then we make our descent. Within 24 hours, every bride will be on her 
throne position. You catch it? And because now the millennium is starting, everybody is in their place on day one. And then it will be gathered in the different nations where they're at. And in Jerusalem, yes, it's not Jesus personally himself doing it, but his 12 apostles doing it. Now remember, they can't all crowd in that temple. That courtyard, if it holds ten thousand, if it holds a thousand or ten thousand people in there, that's about it. Now the reason I'm stressing these things because I know the subject say, well, it's just your idea. I'd have to say, do you have the spirit of revelation? You're probably one if it was never revealed, you believe the streets are gold. But it's just as silly. Well, so now we're going to be in our places when the millennium starts. Now in Revelation chapter 20, where we're at in your, in your Bible, in verse 5 says, But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. The bride has part of the first resurrection, but the bride is not the white robes or the Jews under the altar, right? But then, blessed is he that has part of the first resurrection, you will reign for a thousand years. Because blessed is holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests and king, priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. What do you think your reigning is going to be like? Huh? Are you catching the picture this morning? Matthew 25, verse 31 to 32. If you read it from just an intellectual, carnal point of view, you'll never see the picture. Remember, it's a parable. And when you look at a parable, what is those two verses implying? Jesus' government. Now everything else about the day of the Lord and the beginning of the millennium is plausible on ground. It doesn't destroy the scripture. No more than the foolish virgin going to ask you for oil. I don't know, maybe we got a fat of oil back there. If they happen to come, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give them some in case they need it. That's just as foolish. All right. Now there's another scripture that will pinpoint this when the millennium starts. Go to the book of Daniel now. Chapter 12. Verse 12. Blessed is he that weigheth. Okay, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 12. Actually, you have to read verse 11 to know when that time frame marking begins. It says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away. When is that? In the middle of the week. Not at the beginning of the week, right? So from the time, so it's specifying time. The sacrifice shall be taken away and the dominion that maketh desolate shall be set up. There shall be 1,290 days. From there to 1,290 days, that brings you to the end of the day of the Lord. But, verse 12, brings you that one that came through the tribulation and through the day of the Lord is found in the 12th verse. Blessed is he that waits, that cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. That's 
1335, you measure it from the middle of the week when the sacrifice is, is taken away, 1335, that it brings you exactly on day one of the millennium to start, and he's blessed on day one. Is he just a lucky fellow that he happened to be in Jerusalem just in front of Jesus? It's blessed to everyone that is found in the 1,335 days around the planet. He's going to be called blessed because he has now moved into the millennium. And because it's told to them, Enter thou into the, inherit the kingdom, as if it was somewhere future. They're standing in it. They're allowed to go in and live in the millennium. But the millennium has already started. And the goats are going to be done away with the rod of iron. Because, oh, well, we can't see that much, kill, that God's going to kill someone in the millennium. Does it not Isaiah speaks about how a child, that being 100 years old, is going to die. There's still some people going to be put to death in the millennium that don't obey the directive of the Lord Jesus Christ through the government of his ministry as kingship. Because my Bible tells me the only time death is done away with is when the millennium is over at the white throne judgment. That's the last time death will take place. In the eternal age, there is nobody dying. And no baby is going to be born in the millennium. Are you catching the picture? It's, if there's ever a key to Matthew 25, verse 31, and I keep repeating it. The key is, you can read the literal words, but remember it's a parable portraying a picture and a condition that will actually exist. And what you're seeing in verse 31 and 32 is his government. That, praise the Lord, I, I, to me that's, that's gold. <laughs> and I can see some saying, well, well, no, no, it says exactly what it says. Yeah, and you're the one that sees a mansion up there in glory too, if God had not brought the revelation on it. There's a mansion prepared for us. He's preparing a place. There's no stones or bricks up there. Now, if you can look at that in that term, now remember, why not look at the parable here in Matthew chapter 25? If you're going to literalize everything, you might as well literalize the rest. Well, because Brother Jackson told us, and, and now we have that understanding, and, and Brother Jackson's not here, so we can't trust nobody else, and nobody else knows. My foot. I don't mean to, be, to sound harsh, but speaking soft gets you nowhere. Compromise does not get you nowhere. If I wanted to have fellowship with a whole bunch, I'd just preach a love message. Preach something Brother Jackson has and, and don't go out of those boundaries. This third watch is not going to be dependent on what you rely, what you know, or these brothers seem to be in agreement with that, and so and so. If you don't have that spirit of revelation in you, that comfort that's shown you, things are going to pass you by in this third watch. Things have started already. What about the sevenfold light way back in 2007? What about, I could list a number of nuggets that God has opened up. Well, you're tooting your horn. 
If it's God's word, I have to speak it. If it was my own word, God would destroy it. He'd have somebody raising up saying, here's the real revelation, that's false. But I haven't heard anything. And I know, brother, you've been looking at saying, well, it's time to say what your, your ministry is. If I really want to send them a while, I'd, if I'd say that, they would. If they can't see the ministry that God has laid in my bosom, it was not of my choosing. First of all, I didn't want to be a preacher. I told Brother Jim a couple of times, no, I didn't want to step into the, to the ministry. But God has a way of pushing you. And God's going to use a man that doesn't compromise because there may be some hurt feelings. And that's one thing that sister told me when, when she came over for, for dinner. I'm glad you're not compromising. You're speaking it like it is. And if the sister is more likely hooked on this morning. There's more than, than her. Why are they seeing things? If I didn't care, I would just preach you the safest message that I could find. But I'd be disobeying God. If the servant that knows his Lord's will, and that applies to every servant, what is his will in this hour? Is it not to bring the church further on in deeper depth and higher heights? He's not looking for status quo. If he's given you a pound, he wants to know, have you increased in that pound? And it talks about scribes seeing things new and old. When the Apostle Paul preached the mystery of the grace age, Timothy had, didn't have to go and say, now Lord, I want, a you, I want a revelation. What Paul had, it was new to him. But he's not the vessel that God chose to bring it forth. But it's still new and he preached it. Things old. It's the same as whether it's in the ministry or the body itself. He didn't say, I'm going to show things new and old. Yes, it's to the scribe. But that the body, the body will never get this. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet receives a prophet's reward. And he that receives a good man in the name of a good man receives a good man's reward. In other words, they accept the revelation. They're not the one that brought it, but the same spirit that gives it to the preacher gives it to the recipient of the bride that receives it. And when truth comes on ground, well, we... we We've got to study it. We've got to look at it. We've got to check it out with the ministry, see if it flies. And, and then maybe, maybe we might. You, are, you don't have the spirit. Of, I'd have to say you don't have the spirit of revelation. If whether an individual or the ministry going down that road, you're trusting on numbers, seeing the same thing. Oh, but the brides are all going to see the same thing. Yes, but through leadership. And they have the same spirit of revelation to receive it as God uses one to give it out. Well, this week, I couldn't get away from it. 
God was just opening up the picture. And the key to the revelation of Matthew 25, 31, 32, you've got to look at it in terms of it being a government. And everything falls into place and makes spiritual sense. I don't know about you, but I'm just rejoicing. I don't care if I'm the only one. But I know God has more than one. So praise the Lord. Ah, uh, well, overtime again. I wonder if the Lord pays overtime pay. No, we don't even have to look at it in that way. I hope... You know, I don't believe in preaching an hour and a half, two hours. Unless it's something real interesting that has to be brought forth. That's fine. It has its place. But preach an hour and a half and go ask different ones in that here's the mes- message whatever you can preach. Well, what, what did you hear? Well, I don't know. He mentioned about something. Well, I forgot what it was. Our attention span is only so much. How many love the professor that, well, not they, they were kind of bound by the limit of their time in their classroom, but would go on and on and on and on and on. And then they, I've had a few of those professors, and you, when, when can I get out of here? They're not absorbing. They're just suffering it through. It's best to get a understanding of a revelation than a whole bunch of words being spoken and, well, uh, what, what's going on? All right, I better not go, go contrary to what I'm saying if I preach another half hour. Right? But this is serious. He that speaketh from heaven. But I love God. I love his word. But what about the words he's speaking now? That identifies whether you really love him or you don't. Are you still happy? Nobody's going to throw rocks? Okay, praise the Lord. That's good. Let's just stand this time. If someone has need, that the musicians would come. And, but I just pray that I was able to point, paint a picture that can, we can readily see that it's not a fairy tale or a fancy world, but somewhere things got to be real. So praise the Lord. Lord, at this time, I just pray, Lord, that you take the words that were spoken. I realize, Lord, I'm not an eloquent speaker, but, Lord, you are able to paint the revelation of the picture in the bosom of my brothers and sisters. In Christ Jesus' name I pray, amen. Can we see it? I've been blessed with so many things God's been so good to me I have family and friends To share in all that I do But if I lose it all
nothing in this world that's worth living for. It only leaves you empty and longing for more. He's the only reason I live. Oh, what a reason. I've tried a lot of things to find. Okay, so I guess got double duty today, so praise the Lord. Let's just stand at this time. Brother Dale, if you dismiss us in word of prayer this morning. Yes, Lord. Amen. Lord, bless each one till we meet again. <laughs>